a few years ago, a uh, Colombian elementary age teacher was noticing uh, exclusionary things taking place within her uh, third grade her third grade classroom. One of the things that had been taking place, and this this has kind of been happening across uh, this area of uh, this uh, across South America for for years. Uh, for decades, really, is that the uh, volatility of what has been taking place in Venezuela has led to hundreds and thousands of Venezuelans who have left Venezuela and migrated to, as refugees, to Colombia. And, and what, what has happened with a lot of that is, is, is racism has started to sneak in, and this is one of the things that, that, that the Colombians were dealing with. And there was this disdain for these Venezuelans who were coming across and were basically just living in the country. And one of the things that she began to notice, this teacher began to notice, is that the Venezuelan kids, particularly the ones who were um, different colored skin, were being ostracized in their classes. And in an effort to bring about an inclusive third grade classroom, she decided to begin integrating various dolls in the class, and for one month, this doll would be cared for in the class and shared amongst all of the students. The first doll she brought in was a little, small, black baby doll. And throughout this month, these kids would pass off and care for this black baby doll. And the next month, it was a Hispanic doll. And then the month after that, it was a white doll. And the month after that, it was a doll in a wheelchair. And the month after that, it was a doll missing an arm. And the month after that, it was a doll with dirty and raggedy clothes. And the month after that, it was a doll who was missing a leg. And the month after that, it was a doll wearing various clothes representing various ethnicities from across the world. And by the end of the school year, they had wrestled with all of these dolls. And her class ended up becoming this beacon of inclusivity for the entirety of the school. And by the end of the year, you could not tell the difference between Colombian and Venezuelan children who played together on the playground. It's interesting when you hear stories like that. And yet we live in a world seemingly that at every turn is trying to rip people apart and create communities of exclusivity. And I've told you this before, and I will continue to tell you this again and again and again. As long as they let me preach here, I believe that the church is meant to be God's most inclusive organization that the world has ever known. This morning, we are going to read a story and talk through a story that gets more time in the book of Acts than any other story. And the truth of the matter is, I think it's going to be shocking for a lot of us what the story actually is. Because it is the turning point in a lot of ways for the church. By the time Luke writes this story, and we need, to, we, need, we need to kind of remember a little bit of what's going on. By the time Luke writes this story, this conversation in Acts is taking place 35 plus years after the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension. And the Christian story has taken a little bit of a turn. Even if you remember Acts chapter 1 verse 1 when he writes Theophilus, a Roman citizen, a Roman official. Like, things have changed for the church in a lot of ways, and what began as this movement in Jerusalem has transformed itself by the time Luke actually writes this book that really the Christian movement has become very Gentile-centered. It's not so much about the Jews anymore when Luke actually writes this book. Many, many of the early converts historically speaking, into Christianity who were Jews went back to Judaism for all sorts of reasons, but one of them is the church got too inclusive. And that was a difficult pill to swallow for many who had grown up and been raised for generation after generation after generation thinking, no, we're God's people. No, no, it's just us. And they can be like us 
but they got to act like us, and they got to behave like us, and they got to follow our rituals. And if they do those things, then they can be a part of us. But all of a sudden, the Gentile church took on its own identity and gave itself to the very same principles of Jesus Christ, but it just looked different. And you begin to see culture tear them apart. This morning, I want you to think through a couple of things as we wrestle with this text. I want you to think through two things. You're going to meet a man named Cornelius if you don't know this story. And like I said, this story gets more play in Acts than any other story. But we see this great apostle named Peter, and then we see this Gentile centurion named Cornelius and all of his family. And I wonder if, maybe, just maybe, the truest piece of of conversion in the story, the one thing we're supposed to take from this is not so much the conversion of Cornelius, but it is the conversion or the continued conversion of Peter. I want to read this story for you this morning, and, and again, this is a, a decently lengthy reading, so, so please stick with me. There was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what is called the Italian Regiment. He was a devout man and feared God along with his whole household. He did many charitable deeds for the Jewish people and always prayed to God. About three in the afternoon, he distinctly saw a vision, an angel of God who came in and said to him, Cornelius, staring at him in awe, he said, what is it, Lord? The angel told him, your prayers and your acts of charity have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for Simon, who is also Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier who was one of those who attended him. After explaining everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were traveling and nearing the city, Peter went up to pray on the roof about noon. He became hungry and wanted to eat, but while they were preparing something, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and an object that resembled a large sheet coming down, being lowered by its four corners to the earth. In it were all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and the birds of the sky. A voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, Peter said, for I have never eaten anything impure or ritually unclean. Again, a second time, the voice said to him, What God has made clean, do not call impure. This happened three times. Stop me if you've heard this before with Peter. Something had to take place three times before he figured some things out. This happened three times, and suddenly the object was taken up into heaven. While Peter was deeply perplexed about what the vision he had seen might mean, Right away, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions to Simon's house, stood at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was also named Peter, was lodging there. While Peter was thinking about the vision, the Spirit told him, Three men are here looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them. I'm sorry, go with them with no doubts at all, because I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men and said, Here I am, the one you're looking for. What is the reason you're here? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who has a good reputation with the whole Jewish nation, was divinely directed by a holy angel to call you to his house and to hear a message from you. Peter then invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day he got up and set out with them, and some of the other brothers from Joppa went with him. The following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was expecting them and had called them together and called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up and said, Stand up, I myself am also just a man. While talking with him, he went in and found a large gathering of people. Peter said to them, You know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or, or visit a foreigner, but God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. Church hear that this morning. That's why I came without any objection when I was sent for. So may I ask why you have sent for me? Cornelius replied, four days ago at this hour at three in the afternoon, I was praying in my house. Just, just then a man in dazzling clothing stood before me and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your acts of charity have been remembered in God's sight. 
Therefore, send someone to Joppa and invite Simon here, who is also named Peter. He is lodging in Simon the Tanner's house by the sea. So I immediately sent for you, and it was good for you to come. So now we are all here in the presence of God to hear everything you have been commanded to share with us from the Lord. It's really interesting, this whole story for me, and the story keeps going, okay? This is a lengthy story, and I'm not going to read the whole thing for you for the sake of time, but I do want to kind of pull out some things here. Here is Cornelius, and he is quite a character. He's a God-fearing man. He's extremely generous, and he is known in Caesarea of being this amazingly kind and generous man, especially to the Jews. And yet... Even though he's admired from one perspective, he is still a centurion of the Roman Empire in Caesarea. This is no small thing. He has a hundred men that, that basically work underneath him. And in Caesarea of all places, this is not a joke either, because Caesarea is of vital importance to the Roman Empire. It is this harbor, this beautiful harbor. In fact, Chris and I got a chance to see it earlier this year. We, we walk through this place. It is this beautiful area, but it is a prime place of real estate because so much of the goods that are imported and exported, especially out of Africa, go through Caesarea. And Rome wanted stability in Caesarea as much as they wanted anything because they needed this place to be safe for all of their imports and exports. Cornelius represents some beautiful things, and for Israelites, he represents a lot of things that they hated. And for all of Peter's successes, he still seems to be very slow on the uptake sometimes. Man, I love Peter, and sometimes we beat him in churches because he is not smart, and then at the same time, I turn around regularly, and I'm like, yeah, I'm him. He's probably actually smarter than me. This giant sheet comes out of heaven. There's got to be the craziest vision you've ever had. This giant sheet comes out of heaven, and all of the animals are all seemingly intermingled. All of the things, if you go back to Leviticus chapter 11, you get this crazy lengthy list of all of the animals that Israel is told, do not eat these things. If you eat these things, you will be considered impure, unclean. And if you eat these things, you will show the world that you are not my people. You're basically like everybody else. But all of a sudden in the vision, they're all intermingled. They're all together, and a voice from heaven says, this is clean, kill, and eat. And he still is struggling, like, no, 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 that's not right. I know scripture. I know scripture, and scripture tells me, no, I'm not supposed to do that. Three times he is told, and all of the sudden things start to fit together. He goes to this man, Cornelius, and all of his people, and he enters into the home and meets with this Gentile family because, again, catch this, God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. Again, for the sake of time, I'm going to summarize a little bit of the rest of the story here. Basically, Cornelius and all of his family look at Peter and say, we were told you had a message from God for us. What is it? Peter begins to speak to Cornelius and tell him the gospel story, but what's also interesting is you can still kind of see the pieces turning for Peter because part of what he shared there at the beginning is just not gospel. Did you catch it? He claims that God doesn't show favoritism if the peoples of the nations will fear him and do what is right and acceptable before God. Did you catch it? He tells him a works-oriented interpretation. God doesn't show favoritism if you do the works that honor him. But then he goes back and begins to tell the story of the gospel of Jesus, which seems to be conflicting with one another. Because you and I know this. We know the story of grace and mercy. God does not look at us and say, I show no favoritism to all of you if you behave exactly perfectly. That's not the story. You and I know that. And he begins to kind of walk through this great story of how God came through the Christ. And as Peter is telling the story, if you noticed in the text, 
the Spirit of God comes upon the people. And Peter's the one who's amazed. Peter's the one who's amazed, going, whoa, what is happening? All of a sudden, God is showing me in front of me, God is showing me right here that these people are his. He's claiming them. He's giving them his spirit. And they didn't come to, to God. They didn't come to Christ the way I did. And all of a sudden, it's funny because Peter's like, well, we've already got the spirit of God. I guess we can go do baptism now. Which is pretty interesting considering that some of us grew up in heritages that told us that you definitely did not get the spirit without being baptized I do want to read for you the very end of what takes place here because after after the situation here with Cornelius Peter is basically having an opportunity to share and talk with the other Israelites as they're all amazed at what takes place in this text this is chapter 11, verse 15. He's telling these guys what took place. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit just came down on them, just as it has upon us at the beginning. I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he has also given to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, how could I possibly hinder God? When they heard this, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, So then, God has given repentance resulting in life even to the Gentiles. I find it interesting that as Peter and these Israelites are rehashing the story, they all just kind of fall silent. It's like, wow, okay, what are we supposed to do with this? And Christ did tell us he was going to baptize people with the Holy Spirit. I mean, yes, John's baptizing with water, but God's going to do something different. And then Peter realizes, I cannot be a hindrance to the mission of God. I cannot be a hindrance to people. And the silence is really, really interesting because even in their praise of God, their praise seems more like an astounding, overwhelming amazement almost like they're looking at each other going okay so I guess God gives life even to the people we don't like I guess God gives life even to the different demographics of people that we think are sinners I guess God gives life in places I'm not sure we want him to give life and oh by the way maybe God brings community to people who may not always want to be community together So normally on most sermons, I try to come up with two to three different points. And part of the reason I try to come up with two to three different points is because we're all coming to this text, we're all coming to worship this morning, we're all coming to meet Jesus, but we're coming from so many different stories, backgrounds, hurts, needs, all of those types of things. And I typically try to come up with two to three different things that I think will hit two to three different dynamics in the room. To be honest with you, I have one for this morning. Here's Peter, formerly a zealous and military-driven Jew. He's converted to Jesus, and he's now serving as an apostle. Here is Cornelius, a kind-hearted Roman military man who prays to the Israelite God, receives the Spirit, is baptized, and also belongs to the same Jesus. Neither man knew each other before God intervened. Neither man had a reason to like each other or to fellowship with each other until God intervened. Neither man was certain what God was doing for them or for the other. Neither man had any idea what transformation process God was putting them through or the other one through. Both men needed the Spirit. But neither man knew what God was trying to do. And in spite of the ignorance of both men, God does something beautiful for each of them. 
God is continuing his transformative waves in both men, and neither one of them know what's actually happening. It's crazy to think that both men are completely ignorant to the ways of God, and yet both men find community and blessing together. Here's my point. I don't want to be blown away anymore when God works in ways I'm not used to seeing. I don't want to assume that my experience and my scriptural interpretations are the only way to view God's work. I don't want to be blinded by the fact that, yes, I have had these experiences in my life. I have learned to read scripture in a certain way. And then when God moves and reclaims somebody in a way that I'm not used to seeing, I don't want to treat them with exclusion. I don't want to treat other demographics of people who I've been told I should treat with disgust. I don't want to treat them with disgust if God is reclaiming them for him. And the church should not want that. Rather than assuming that God only works in the ways that we have experienced, we should assume that God works in ways we have no idea. We should assume that God works in grand ways well beyond our experiences and that he reclaims people however he wants to. Notice all of the things that have taken place in Acts just within the first nine chapters before we get to this one. People have received the Spirit of God without being baptized. Some of them have been baptized and not received the Spirit of God. Some of them have received the Spirit of God. They've also been baptized, and they're still treated as exiles amongst God's people. And you begin to see all of the ways in which God is moving. And the truth of the matter is this, one thing only. I don't know how God works or why he does what he does. I don't know. But what I do know is that God is love and he is actively pursuing each and every individual based upon what they need. That ought to be a bigger amen, I'm not going to lie. You know? Like three of you were like, yeah. The rest of us were like, is that okay to amen? Is that, is that all right? Yes. God goes after people based upon what they need. And he brings them to himself in a relationship that they have. And yeah, some of us are a little more hard-headed than the rest of us. But a lot of us who have come to Jesus early on, we just got self-righteous. Just being honest. And in the beauty of this story, what we see is that a man that should have been despised by God's people He becomes the most transformative story for this man we know as Peter. Because in just a couple of chapters, there's going to be a council at Jerusalem. And it's the only church leadership story that we see in all of Scripture. And what takes place at this council at Jerusalem is the Jerusalem church trying to figure out, oh my goodness, God might be working in ways we've never seen. And Peter stands up in front of the entire church, in front of all of the apostles, in front of Paul and Silas, who even attend this meeting, and he says, let me tell you the story of Cornelius. Let me tell you how I have seen God redeem those I thought were irredeemable. We live in a culture determined to impress upon us tribalism. And what I mean by that, if you don't necessarily are familiar with that term, we live in a culture that is determined to impress upon us that you find your segment of people that you know are loyal to you and you can be loyal to them and you just sit there and everybody else is treated as a threat. Everyone. 
Washington, D.C., just to probably, if I'm not mistaken, when I'm reading this uh, story, there was a social experiment done back in 2010. And one of the highest police officers in the city, a black man decided that he was going to do a social experiment just to figure out what life was like in the area. So he bought himself an oversized hoodie. He walked around the city around nighttime, just after dark. And he began to ask people, hey, uh, I don't have a cell phone, um, and I need, to get a, I need to call my, uh, my girlfriend, and I, I need a ride. Can I borrow your cell phone? And over and over and over, he was denied. Over and over. What's really interesting is, is that in most of these situations, towards the end of the deal, he lifted up his oversized hoodie and he said, uh, I'm a lieutenant in the police department. Can I use your phone now? And immediately everybody was like, oh, okay, here, take it. Yes, do whatever you want. And again, another social experiment about how we fear the other. How we look at people, and based upon how they look or how they act, we take a step back and we go, whoa, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, not quite certain how to deal with that. The interesting thing for Peter is that later on in Galatians chapter 2, we will come to realize that Peter is still struggling with this, in, this inclusivity conversation. And Paul tells us, Peter again refused to eat with Gentiles and I had to care for him by restoring him to show him, hey, you draw him lines that God's not. I want so badly the church to be seen. I know, okay, we are worried. I know that we fear. I know that we feel like it's our job to like protect the holiness of the church. One, that is not your job. It is not your job, it is not my job to protect the holiness of Jesus' church. It is your job to love and let me give you a different definition of holiness. And I'll finish with this. In a lot of ways, many of us have been raised to view holiness as moral behavior. And if I act the right way, if I do the right things, and if I don't do the wrong things, and I love God, that is considered holiness. And so then we feel like when we recognize bad behavior or unethical or sinful behavior in the lives of others, then we begin to make this distinction and we say, that's unholy, and if they're a part of the church, then they need to figure this out. Or maybe that's what makes them not a part of the church. And then we begin to draw a line. Look at the grand story of Scripture. In God's own behavior, what determines holiness? It's how well he loves. The overarching story of Scripture of what makes God perfectly God, it's how well he loves and how much he seeks healthy, divine relationship with every single person. And if the church could adopt that idea, we would enter into the world desiring holy relationships, driven by love, driven by a desire that we share with one another our resources, we share with one another our gifts, we go out into the world and we say, we will love, we will give, we will forgive, we will do anything we possibly can in order to have right relationships with others because that's what our Christ did and no one is more holy than him. church is called to be the most inclusive organization the world has ever known. And the same power that led Jesus to do ministry is living within you. You have been baptized by the Holy Spirit for this mission. And if they walk away from that, they walk away from that, but it better not be because we did not give them the good news. I hope you will come join us in connection class across the way and have more conversation with us. I want to pray for us. We're going to have one more song. God, we love you so much. 
Give us your heart for others. Give us freedom from fear. Cement in us, God, that you have been resurrected. That death and fear and sin are defeated and we can enter into this world with the same love as you. For those, God, who are fighting your message, may we continue to devote ourselves in love to them. For each of us in the room, for each of us across the world today, God, give us a humility to your spirit so that you might transform us. And empower your church, God, with the greatest testimony ever, and it is that you, Jesus Christ, became man in order to love and to redeem. It is through this Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing.